So thank you all for coming. It's really nice to come down to Rhode Island. It's like 15 degrees warmer here than it is in Salem. <laughs> Spring has never come yet this year. Um, I brought all these quotes and then I didn't need them. Um, so, uh, I'm a historian and I approach immigration as an activist but also as a historian. And um, I study history of Latin America, but in studying history of Latin America, you inevitably have to study history of the United States. And when you look at the history of the United States from a Latin American perspective or from a global perspective, it starts to look really different than the way you learned it in elementary school. Um, and one of the things that looks really different is the importance of the concept of settler colonialism. Now, when I talk to my students who've all had like 20 years of American history before they get into my college classes, um, I always ask how many of you have heard of settler colonialism, and I do not think I have yet had a student raise, except one who was Canadian, um, <laughs> raise their hand and say that they had heard of settler colonialism. So to me, the concept of settler colonialism is absolutely the key concept for understanding everything about American history. And maybe that's why we avoid it so studiously. But I'm going to tell some of the history that is probably very familiar to most of you, but from the perspective of settler colonialism, and think about how different it looks when when we start from that viewpoint. Um, and I'm going to tell 400 years of history very quickly. <laughs> um, so one of the myths that we tell about ourselves is that the United States is a country of immigrants. Now, like all myths, it's sort of true, but it all depends how you look at it, what you mean when you say it. Um, and I want to point out some of the things that are hidden when we usually say that we are a country of immigrants by going to a quote from our former president, Barack Obama. Um, and it's a quote that, um, where he's expressing a view that I think all of us have heard and maybe even expressed. He says, we share the view that one of the great strengths of the United States has always been its well willingness to welcome new immigrants to our shores. That's what made us unique and special. Now, when President Obama said this, or when any one of the millions of other people, including many of us in this room, who have said this, um, what we mean when we say this is that we want to welcome the immigrants who are coming to the United States now. So it comes from an, an open and welcoming um, frame of mind, and yet it hides a lot about our history that I think we need in, that we need to understand in order to truly welcome the immigrants who are coming to the United States now. Um, another way of explaining what we are um, is instead of a country of immigrants, um, comes from a quote from a book that was just published last year by Harvard historian Jill Lepore called These Truths, A History of the United States. Um, she points out that between 1500 and 1800, roughly two and a half million Europeans moved to the Americas. They carried 12 million Africans there by force, and as many as 50 million Native Americans died, chiefly of disease. So when we say that we are a country of immigrants, we're actually talking about those two and a half million Europeans, and we're not talking about the 12 million Africans or the 50 million Native Americans. So saying that we are a country of immigrants, I believe, actually tries to sanitize our history. It tries to tell, or perhaps whitewash would be a good word, it tells the history of the United States as if it were a history of white people. And it leaves out the histories of people of color. 
Just going back to Obama, President Obama's words for a minute, he said, it's willingness to welcome new immigrants to our shores. Now, he uses the word shores in the plural, which implies that it means the Atlantic and the Pacific. It doesn't mean our southern border. That's not a shore, right? And really, it doesn't mean the Pacific either, because when exactly have we welcomed immigrants coming to our Pacific coast? Like with the Chinese Exclusion Act? Is that when we welcomed immigrants to our Pacific coast? That is really the only shore we have always welcomed new immigrants to is our Atlantic shore. That is where we see the Statue of Liberty. That is where we have Ellis Island. That is where uh, we have the quote by, from the poem by Emma Lazarus, give us your tired, your poor. All of that mythology of how we are a nation of immigrants constructs us as a country of European people and erases the history of those who were not welcomed as immigrants, Native Americans, African Americans, Asians, Latin Americans. It's a story of white European immigration. Does everybody follow me here? So it's a, it's, it's comforting to tell ourselves that we have always welcomed new immigrants to our shores, but it's a lie. We've always welcomed new white immigrants to our shores. And we need to be honest about that if we want to understand what is happening with immigration today. Um, I have a couple of maps here. So, uh, I'm not sure everybody can read the little words there, but you all recognize the outline of what the map is, right? At least that everyone can see. Um, so, this map is entitled North America in 1700. It's a typical kind of map that appears in textbooks, um, history textbooks, including text textbooks that we use in US history classes in college. And it's a color-coded map, and there's a key at the bottom right that tells us what the different colors uh, represent. And so I just want to read to you uh, what the key says. Um, the dark red burgundy color is English settlements. The lighter pink is English influence. The dark green is French settlements. The light green is French influence. And the dark gold is Spanish settlements. The light gold is Spanish influence. So there's a couple of things I would like you to notice about this map of North America in 1700. One, there's hardly any Europeans there. Right? North America in 1700 is native land. Europeans have barely made any incursions into North America in the year 1700. There's very, very few Europeans and they occupy a very small amount of territory. But these Europeans seem to have a lot of influence, even where they haven't settled. Another thing I'd like you to notice about this map is that it only tells us about Europeans. It tells us where Europeans have settled. It even tells us where Europeans have influence, but it doesn't tell us who Europeans have influence on. There's this whole invisible population that doesn't merit a name on the map. Europeans are so important that, that places where they have influence means need to be named on the map. Native Americans are so unimportant that the fact that they occupy 99%, 85% of the continent, somewhere between those two numbers, um, does not merit a, a mention on this map. 
So I would like to use this map to define settler colonialism. Um, going back to the title of my talk. So settler colonialism refers to one particular type of colonialism that characterizes the United States and also Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Those are the four big examples of settler colonialism. Now how does settler colonialism differ from other forms of colonialism, the kind that we are more accustomed to studying and naming as colonialism. So if we look at Spanish colonialism in the Americas, or if we look at British colonialism in India, or French colonialism in Africa or in Southeast Asia, we see what we are generally taught to think of as colonialism. That is, a few Europeans rule over a large native population. A small number of Europeans, and the colonial project is one of rule over other peoples, imposing European rule over an existing population. Settler colonialism is different. Settler colonialism is based on what historians have named the logic of elimination. A settler colonial project seeks to eliminate the native population, erase the native population, and replace it with a white European population. So genocide, Literal genocide is one part of settler colonialism, creating an empty land so that Europeans can settle it, can make true what they, what they want to believe, that there's nobody living there, what this map tries to tell us, that it's a land just waiting for Europeans to arrive and, and settle it or influence it. Um, but also, it's, uh, settler colonialism is, is an ideological project of erasure. That is, it allows us to make maps like this, in which the native population doesn't appear. So the map kind of justifies the way we're taught to think about the history. And immigration plays a very special role in settler colonial societies. That is, the only way to create a white European country in a land that belongs to native people, whether they're Canadian First Nations or Australian Aboriginals or Native Americans, um, is to bring in a lot of white people. So immigrants actually play a privileged role in a settler colonial society. So again, going back to Barack Obama's words that one of the great strengths of the United States has always been its willingness to welcome new immigrants to our shores. Now, he did not intend to be making a racist comment here, but he was. That is, he was saying that what makes the United States great is that we filled it with white people. <laughs> Um, most of us don't mean that when we say it, but what it shows is how we've been educated to think about the country and what counts and what matters in our history. Um, so this privileged status of immigrants and the definition of immigrants as white people was made very clear at the time of the American Revolution, when one of the objections that the, what we call the settlers, we don't talk about settler colonialism, but we call them settlers, um, so I will call them the colonizers here. Um, one of the objections that the colonizers made to British rule was the fact that the British had actually come to an agreement with the native populations known as the Proclamation of 1763, which you can see in this map on the left. This is 
yes, I have a nice long cable here. Um, the proclamation of 1763 drew this red line, more or less down the Appalachian Mountains, um, stating that the British would not support white settlement beyond that line that beyond that line, they acknowledge native sovereignty over the land. Now, the white colonizers were very unhappy with this. They wanted more land. And in order to take more land, they also wanted more immigration. Now, we don't learn that this is the cause of the American Revolution, but it's right there in the Declaration of Independence. If you read down the list of, of justifications of why these colonizers want to break with the colonial power, um, the preamble says, the history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. Um, and we think that that has to do with like, taxes and and representation and things like that. But if you read down, one of the things that they mention is he has endeavored to prevent the population of these states. That is, he's restricting immigration. He's not letting us bring enough white people here to, to uh, enlarge our settler colonial project. For that purpose, obstructing the laws for the naturalization of foreigners. That is, making it, the king is making it more difficult for white immigrants to naturalize or become citizens. And that's part of the agreement with the native tribes is that the king will stop sponsoring immigration. The more white people means more land grabs. Um, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither. Again, the king is refusing to pass laws encouraging more migration. And raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. That is putting conditions, putting limits on our ability to take new lands. Immigration and taking land are two sides of the same coin. White immigrants need to come in order to uh, replace the native population that is in the process of being eliminated in this settler colonial project. Everybody still with me? So, let me just say one more thing about the American Revolution. Um, we're taught to think of the American Revolution as an anti-colonial revolution, right? It's a revolution against colonialism. If you really think about it, the American Revolution was not an anti-colonial revolution. It was a pro-colonial revolution. And this, uh, to illustrate this, I want to compare the American Revolution to the next anti-colonial revolution in the Americas, the Haitian Revolution. And not only the Haitian Revolution, but pretty much every subsequent anti-colonial revolution in the history of the world. Every other anti-colonial revolution has been carried out by the people who were colonized. And the goal has been to send the white colonizers back home. When the Haitians rebelled, it was not the French elite, slave-holding elite, who rebelled against France. It was the slaves who rebelled. And they threw out the white slave-holding elite. They abolished the slave system and they declared Haiti a free black country. When Vietnam rebelled against the French, it wasn't the French in Vietnam who rebelled against France, it was the Vietnamese. They wanted the French to leave. But in the American Revolution, it was the colonizers who rebelled. There were other 
revolutions that tried to expel the English colonizers. There was the Pequot War, there was the Pueblo Uprising, uh, there was King Philip's War. There were many attempts on, but on the part of the people who were colonized to throw out the English colonizers. But the American Revolution was not one of those attempts. The American Revolution was a rebellion by the white settler planter elite, one of whose goals was to expand the colonial project. If you look at the map on the right, again, it's kind of small, so I don't think you can exactly see what it is, but I will explain it to you. So in 1763, this is the line that the, that the crown drew, dividing colonizer territory from free native sovereign territories. After the American Revolution, or counter-revolution, as some call it, um, all of the colonies began to expand. And this uh, map on the right looks at uh, land claims from 1782 to 1802. That is, what, the 20 years after independence? Um, every single state expanded westward over that line. So not only did they say they wanted to do that, they did it as soon as they gained their independence and were able to overturn the Treaty of, eight, of 1763. But of course they didn't stop there. Um, we've heard of things like the Louisiana Purchase, who exactly did these colonizers purchase Louisiana, which is much more than just Louisiana, from? The French. Who actually lived in all of that territory? Native Americans. So Indian removal becomes one of the key policies of the new country from the moment it becomes independent. And the entire 19th century is a century of Indian removal. After the Mexican-American War, when, did I put a map of that? No, I didn't. Um, when that uh, territory that is now Texas and uh, everything else to the west of it is taken from Mexico, again, who lived there? Native Americans. So the new country needs an army and it needs private militias because its first century is a century of white settler colonial warfare and genocide. It also needs a lot more white immigrants to be able to carry out these wars, to carry out this genocide, to carry out this removal, and to create a white country on native land. Of course, they also continue the slave system, the importation of slaves from Africa, and the uh, system of enslaving Africans. Um, the United, there were only three countries that held out longer than the United States, supposedly this revolutionary country of freedom, um, in maintaining the slave system. If we had remained a British colony, slavery would have been abolished here two generations earlier than it actually was. Uh, if we had been, uh, well, the Spanish colonies, Spain lost most of its colonies, but it, it kept slavery in its last two colonies, Cuba and Puerto Rico, even longer than we did, though not much longer than we did. So, being a country of immigrants meant being a white country. That is, only white people could be citizens of this new country. And that was very clearly legislated in 1790 by the US Congress. 
um, in the first naturalization law. Now remember, in the Declaration of Independence, one of the things the colonizers objected to was that the crown was making it more difficult for white people to naturalize. So, of course, they want to make it easy. And the new naturalization law in 1790 states that be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that any alien being a free white person who shall have resided within the limits and under the jurisdiction of the United States for the, ter the term of two years may be admitted to become a citizen thereof. So they want to make it as easy as possible for white people to become citizens. Because in order to have a white country, a country of, by, and for white people, in a land that's inhabited primarily by people of color, you need more and more and more white people, especially as you're trying to settle this new land to replace the population of the lands as the United States continually expands westward. So immigrants were not only welcomed, they were recruited, uh, actively recruited, um, with promises of easy naturalization for white people. Now this remained the case that the United States was a country of, by, and for white people. Immigrants were defined as white people because only a white person could be considered an immigrant, could be eligible to naturalize and become a citizen of the country. Um, for the first 100 years or so, until the Civil War. Now, the Civil War, Reconstruction, changed a few things. And one of the things it changed was a recognition on the part of the federal government uh, an attempt to uh, rectify some of the wrongs of the forced transport of so many people from Africa, their exclusion from citizenship, their enslavement, um, and to create equal citizenship, equal rights for people of African descent. And there are two ways that this was done right after the Civil War. One was through the 14th Amendment. 1868. All the 14th Amendment creates something completely new, citizenship by birth. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. This is the first time that citizenship is de-racialized, that a person who is not white can become a citizen. Now you can become a citizen simply by being born in the United States. And this amendment starts with a very inclusive word, the word all. That sounds, that sounds pretty, pretty definitive, pretty inclusive, right? But it's not, because it's qualified. It's not enough to be born. You have to also be subject to the jurisdiction thereof. <coughs> Who is not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States? Native Americans are excluded from citizenship by birth. So it starts with the word all, but then it goes on to say, except Native Americans. So basically, citizenship by birth is created for white people and African Americans. This is what Congress has in mind. And the fact that this is what Congress has in mind becomes even more clear if you look at the Naturalization Act of 1870. So who is allowed to become a citizen through naturalization? If you're not born in the United States, if you come from somewhere else, uh, naturalization um, originally applied only to free white persons. Now it's expanded the naturalization laws are hereby extended to aliens of African nativity and to persons of African descent, and nobody else. Who else is immigrating to the United States in 1870? 
who is not covered by the new Naturalization Act. Chinese are not covered by the new Naturalization Act. They are neither aliens of African nativity, persons of African descent, or free white persons. Who else? Irish Italians. Well, the Irish are considered white persons. People from Central America. Okay, so remember how Barack Obama said, welcome immigrants to our shores, and he was really talking about like New York and Ellis Island and the Atlantic. This new Naturalization Act comes from the same mindset. That is, immigrants are white people who come from Europe. If you come from Asia, if you come from Mexico, you do not count as an immigrant. You are not eligible to naturalize. Now, it looks good on paper that the naturalization laws are extended to aliens of African nativity and persons of African descent. But how many people do you think are immigrating from Africa in 1870? Not many. Not many. Not many. So this, these, these laws look inclusive, but they're really not quite as inclusive as they look. Um, the extent to which the project of recruiting and fostering and rewarding white immigration was a settler colonial project is illustrated in this advertisement um, designed to attract white immigrants. Indian land for sale. The year here is 1911. Get a home of your own, easy payments, perfect title, possession within 30 days, fine lands in the West. And it names all the states, Colorado, Idaho, Kansas, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota. Uh, in 1910, the Department of the Interior sold under seal uh, bids allotted Indian land as follows. So this is how European immigrants are being recruited to take native land. This is the open policy of the country. It's there in the immigration laws, it's there in the Declaration of Independence, and it's there in the uh, campaigns to, uh, to bring in European immigrants. So let me run through um, some of the legislation, uh, and I actually intersperse here laws about immigration and laws about land, because as I said, they can't be separated, immigration and land. Um, the Homestead Act in 1862, offering free land to white settlers, free Indian land. Uh, at the same time, the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, um, exclusionary immigration laws follow upon citizenship by birth. Before 1868, before we have citizenship by birth, there is no need to prevent people who are not white from coming here because they can never be citizens. It will always be a white country because that's what the law says. Only white people can be citizens. After citizenship by birth is created, Congress realizes that non-white people are becoming citizens when they are born here. So Chinese immigration can no, Chinese immigrants can no longer be excluded from citizenship because if a Chinese baby is born here, unlike a Native American baby, that baby will be a citizen. So restrictive immigration laws start to uh, be implemented right after citizenship by birth is created. And the, the restrictive immigration laws are completely racialized. While Chinese, exclusion, uh, Chinese immigration is being le legislated as illegal, 
The United States is also passing the Dawes Act, which breaks up native reservations and puts them land for sale on the free market. That's the allotment system that's being talked about in this 1910 poster. Now, this is the period of heavy European immigration into the United States, right? Late 19th and early 20th century. So the Dawes Act is a very important part of that recruitment of European immigrants. The Chinese Exclusion Act is followed by Exclusion Act after Exclusion Act, um, culminating in 1917 with what is uh, legislated to be the Asiatic Barred Zone. And this is made permanent in the 1924 Immigration Act, which states no alien ineligible to citizenship shall be admitted to the United States. Now, we already know that only two kinds of aliens are eligible to citizenship, free white <coughs> aliens and aliens of African nativity and African descent. So the entire rest of the world cannot be admitted to the United States because they are not eligible to citizenship. Still, in 1924, immigration from Africa does not exist. Um, almost all of Africa is colonized by Europeans at this time. There's no countries in Africa as we know them today. Um, it's been divided up into, into colonies by the European powers. Um, so the term ineligible to citizenship when used in reference to any individual includes an individual who is debarred from becoming a citizen of the United States. That is anybody who is not either a free white alien or an alien of African, a free white person or an alien of African nativity and African descent. Um, so the 1924 Immigration Act for the first time also placed restrictions on European immigration. And the period from 19, 1924 to 1965 is known of as the period of restrictive immigration if you study immigration history. Now once again, it only stands out in that respect if you assume that history means the history of white people because the period from 1924 to 1965 is the period when white immigration was excluded. Non-white immigration was always excluded. Uh, and non-white citizenship was excluded. When you just said it's not clear. Okay, sorry. So you just repeated? Yes. So in the 1924 Immigration Act, not only restricted Asian immigration, that is reinforced what had already been set up in 1917, it also, for the first time, placed numerical restrictions on European immigration. So, if you study immigration history, you will learn that 1924 until 1965, when it changed again, is the period of restrictive immigration, immigration restrictions. So when President Obama says we are a country that has always welcomed immigrants to our shores, some immigration historian will say, well, actually between 1924 and 1965, we didn't. But the only thing that makes 1924 to 65 stand out is that there were restrictions on European immigration. There were always restrictions on non-European immigration and non-European citizenship. So when we refer to this period as the period of restrictive immigration, we're kind of doing the same thing that that map I showed at the very beginning did, and saying that, well, obviously we only talk about white people when we talk about history, so therefore we'll call this period the period of restrictive immigration because it's the period when white people were restricted. Does that make more sense? Um, but why did we get restricted then? So, the uh, European immigration was restricted in 1921 and 24. It was a, a process of two different laws um, in a context of Anglo Saxon nerves about too many non Anglo Saxon European immigrants coming into the country. 
So the white Europeans who were restricted were the people from Italy, the people from Poland, the people from Russia, the people from Greece, the people who were legally classified as white, but who were not Anglo-Saxon Protestants. People who spoke funny languages. People who spoke funny languages, exactly. There's also the time of Jewish po pogroms going on in Russia and Poland, etc. Yes. Oftentimes, a lot of um, Jewish immigration happening is the same. Thing. Yes, um, they were not Protestant. They were Jewish. They were Orthodox. They were Catholic, um, but they were not Protestant. So, so yes, that's the period of restrictions on European immigration. But while all this is going on, Mexicans are treated completely differently under U.S. law. So, I say European countries got quotas. Asia was defined as three quarters of the planet's territory, and Asians were all deemed aliens ineligible to citizenship. But Mexico and the rest of the Americas were not covered by this 1924 law. They were not even mentioned by the 1924 law. So what's going on with Mexicans? The need for Mexican labor in these newly conquered territories of the American West was so great in agriculture, in railroad building, in mining, especially after Chinese and other Asian immigration was restricted, that a completely different regime was set up for Mexicans. And I call it inviting and deporting Mexicans. Mexicans were recruited, but not like Europeans as immigrants. They were not offered Indian land. Uh, they were not offered citizenship. They were offered work and deportation. So a completely separate system was set up for Mexicans to be brought to the United States, to be recruited in Mexico, but not as potential citizens, as seasonal, temporary, deportable workers. So this, this treatment of Mexicans as not immigrants, but rather deportable workers, um, happens in a number of different ways between 1848 and 1965. Uh, it happens through guest worker programs, it happens through massive so-called repatriation, that is massive deportations of Mexicans. And Mexican, I should point out, is considered to be a racial quality. That is, in these repatriations or deportations of Mexicans, it wasn't about citizenship. It wasn't about papers. You didn't need any papers to get into the United States at that time if you're coming across the southern border. If you're Mexican, you're automatically deportable and not eligible to citizenship. So the idea is better Mexicans because they won't have children. We'll just bring in the men, make them work, and send them home. They're so easy to deport, unlike the Chinese. This is the case until 1965. In 1965, and this is my last slide, I'm gonna stop here, uh, but I do wanna talk about 1965 because this is the regime that we still live under, the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act or Hart Seller Act. 1965 undoes the quota system of 1924. That's why I said that period 1924 to 1965 is the period of the quotas. 1965 undoes this. Now, think for a minute about, clearly the 1924 law obeyed the political climate of the 1920s. Um, the 1965 law responds to the political climate of the 1960s. So a couple of the things that are going on in the 1960s, anti-colonial revolutions in places like Cuba, Africa, um, civil rights movements in the United States, the Cold War, where the United States is trying to present itself in the international sphere as a beacon of freedom and equality and treating people well. Um, so explicitly racial legislation 
is undone in the United States. And the immigration law, the restrictive quotas that privilege Anglo-Saxon Northern Europeans and don't allow immigration from other parts of the world, um, also have to go in the 1960s. So the 1965 law sets up what they call a uniform quota. Every single country in the world gets the same quota. Every single country, so no one's discriminated against anymore. Every single country gets a quota of 20,000 immigrant visas a year. Now, up until 1965, hundreds of thousands of Mexicans were being imported every year to work and being deported back to Mexico. All of a sudden, this is ended. Because remember, there were no restrictions on Mexican migration before 1965, but Mexicans were always deportable. Now that is deemed racist, so Mexicans are given this quota of 20,000 a year, and suddenly there's a new rationale for deporting Mexican workers. They're illegal. This is how illegality is created as a colorblind way to continue treating Mexican workers unlike any other kind of immigrant. The border is still open. People are still allowed to come in, but their deportability now relies not on their race, their Mexicanness, but on their lack of papers. That is, migration from Mexico is criminalized in order to have a non-racist rationale for a system that has been in place for over 100 years. So that's how immigration became illegal and why we have to put settler colonialism at the foundation of any attempt to understand our immigration history. Thank you.